we are not a self-help church, okay? In other words, we, we are committed to preach biblically and a focus on Jesus Christ and be true to his word because there's no help apart from that. So it's not just three easy steps to better your life and live a more carefree life. That's not what this is. However, we like to do series like this and others similar to this because we want you to know that being a follower of Jesus Christ, we want you to know that his death and his resurrection has a practical and a powerful impact on your everyday life. Right? It's not just Sundays, it's not just Easter, it's not just for heaven someday. It's, it's man, follower, being a follower of Jesus is, is, is relevant and, and impacts every other area of your life. And so we, we want you to know, we want you to have the joy of knowing that his word can be practically applied. And, and you leave here being able to put that into practice. So that's why we're doing something like this. I don't want anybody to think this is just superficial um, stuff, right? This is, we're going to be grounded in God's word today focused on knowing and following Jesus better. Sound good? All right. We wanted to do a series like this, though, especially at this time of year, because honestly, between now and really through January, we're in this crunch time um, known as the holiday season, correct? Some of you may have already begun. How many of you get your Christmas shopping done? Don't, don't even do it. Don't even... Yeah, yeah, some of you, you're, you, you know who you are. It's already ramping up, and, and some, we got Thanksgiving coming up, and that's amazing, and, and, then, and then the celebration of Christ's birth, and let me tell you, that Christmas is going to be amazing here at JC Naz, okay? So if you're watching online and you can get here during uh, our celebration of Christmas, you want to be here, we've got some wonderful things planned, and, and it's going to be just a wonderful Christmas um, celebration. And, and, and then um, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, all of that's combined. So now through the end of January, and for a lot of us as families, you know, because of the dynamics of your family, maybe a lot of blended families, um, and then we're so mobile now, we're spread out across great distances, especially in a military community, now that's the reality. And so what I'm trying to say is these, these celebrations that are coming along the way here in this season, they're not just one day events, they're spread out over several weeks for most of us, right? You may have two or three Thanksgivings or multiple Christmases, but we know as wonderful as that is, it comes with a lot of stress, right? And, and a lot of pressure sometimes, sadly, and so God wants to help us to navigate that. And, you know, you've got the pressure of travel and the stress of, of the financial burden sometimes, you know, increases this time of year. Um, and then family strain, family tension, outright conflict perhaps, sometimes in families and extended families. And it's just enough to stress a person out, correct? Studies show us that stress is is not a unique thing uh, to you or to me. It's, it's a very common human experience. That's why we're doing this series, because we know you all can relate to this. Studies show that, that many people say that their stress comes from really four main categories, okay? And just, just evaluate your own life as I read these out. Ready? Time or schedule, schedule slash time, work, money, and relationships. So how many of you would say, yes, the stress in my life is pretty much summed up in, in those categories, Correct? That pretty much covers all the stress in my life, you might say. I, I think it's true for me, for sure, as I, as I look, uh, you know, and examine that. But, but here's the truth. If we, don't ex if we don't deal with this stress in our life, if we got to blow it off and think it's not that big a deal and hope to present some things this morning that would convince you otherwise of that, if you feel that way. But if we don't deal with this biblically, if we don't get intentional this morning about, I mean, if we don't make some serious changes, for some of you, this is true, by the time we leave here, there's so much at stake. Most of all, we tend to forfeit our joy and our peace. We tend to forfeit our closeness with Christ that he intends for his followers to live with. But this is what I want you to know this morning, okay? I want you to be absolutely convinced of this. For some of you, it's a reminder. But I want to say to myself and I want to say to everyone listening this morning that you can experience in your day-to-day -day life Regardless of your circumstance, regardless of the demands and pressures on your life, you can experience the kind of deep, lasting, powerful peace and joy that only Jesus can bring. You don't have to wait till things slow down, as we say. You don't have to wait till circumstances. You can experience that right here, right now. Amen? How many of you believe that? You, you can. It, it's the, the promise of God's word to his followers. But here's the, here's the, here's the catch. You have to choose it. 
You have to choose it. It's not, God's not going to sprinkle it on you magically like fairy dust. Like, there's a little joy, you know. No, you have to, really you have to make some significant choices to, to align yourself with him, to abide in him. And not just choose joy, but to choose to do it God's way. Because how many of you know that true joy, deep abiding joy and peace that, that surpasses all of your circumstances and, and the, the situations you're in right now that cause stress. How many of you know that only comes, listen carefully, that only comes from a close, personal, growing, active relationship with the living God through his son Jesus Christ, okay? And here's what excites me about today and about us gathering like this right now. It's the opportunity to say to you again that if you do not have, if you do not have a close, personal, exciting, vibrant, deep relationship with the God who made you through faith in his son Jesus Christ, let me just tell you, you can have that before you leave today. Because it's yours by asking, amen? It's yours by turning to him and just saying in faith, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, I need you, forgive my sins, I, I received the gift of eternal life that you died and rose again to give me, and just opening your life to him, you can experience that. Your, your whole life could change if you've not yet made that decision. Because Jesus says to us very clearly in John 15, 5, he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. In other words, you know, that's where you get your, I mean, your source, that's where you get your nourishment, your life sources from. And if you remain in me, see it's a choice, right? To, to day by day remain in him to follow his lead. And I in you, then you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But if we're judgment day honest with God this morning and ourselves, we would have to admit that, that although, you know, we believe that perhaps in our heart, that yes, apart from God, I, I can do nothing but then outside these walls in our everyday life and circumstances that we find ourselves, we, we often live as if that's not true, as if we can do it all because we're trying to do it all and we're stressed out as a whole and we're filled with anxiety and, and we don't have a lot of joy sometimes or a lot of peace. But sometimes we have to admit that the, the source of our stress and anxiety in our lives, which by the way, stress is not a sin in and of itself, okay? If you're stressed, it's not, you're not sinning. But we need to admit that much of our stress comes from the sin of seeking security and comfort and joy and peace apart from Jesus. Y'all hear what I'm saying? That's, if we're honest, that's where a lot of our stress, in fact, I'd say all of our stress is coming from, that I'm trying to do life in, in this area. Maybe, maybe I'm following him in a lot of ways, in a lot of areas, but I'm trying to do this on my own. Or maybe I'm trying to do a lot on my own. And the the Holy Spirit this morning wants to show us a much better way from his word, okay? So the theme verse that I really want to focus on today, really not just for this message, kind of anchor this entire series to, is found in Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. And Luke 21 is a really interesting chapter because if you're, if you're interested at all in end time studies or end time conversations, well, Jesus, Jesus has some, some things to say about that. And so Luke chapter 21 would be good. If, if that really interests you, you want to try to learn more biblically, not just speculation, but biblically, um, this would be a good passage to go read in its entirety and study. And not just Luke 21, but there's actually a companion passage over in Matthew 24 that basically says the same thing. But a different author, Matthew and Luke, were two men um, that wrote about the life and times of Jesus. But let's look at Luke 21 this, this, this morning. Luke 21, 34. Jesus then wraps up his teaching on, on end times and what it's going to look like and how to be ready by saying this. Be careful. He says, be careful. And, and what he then does is he highlights something that is so important for us to remember. And, and that is simply this. That there is a much more dangerous type of stress than just the stuff on the outside, just the stuff that's surrounding us. If we're not careful, stress can get a hold of us, okay? It can get a hold of us. It can get on the inside of us and can consume us within. So Jesus says, be careful. Let me just read the verse for you. Luke 21, 34. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down. That, that If some of you could stand up right now and just say, you would say, that's me. I feel like even in this worship service, my, my, 
I, I'm just so filled with, I got all this stuff going on, and I, I, don't, I got stuff happening afterwards, and my heart is weighed down. And then it says, be careful, your hearts will be weighed down with carousing. It mentions drunkenness and the anxieties of life, just anxiety of life in general from many different sources. And then he says, that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. Let me just talk about the word carousing for a minute because it's not a word where we use a lot, but it means to indulge one app one's appetites excessively. And it could be lots of different things that we do that with. But listen, this world, I'm telling you, this world through its advertising, through social media, will try to target, I would actually say manipulate our appetites. And, and you can't turn on the television today. You can't log on to social media without them aggressively targeting your, and, and tapping into your appetites and saying, try this new technique and, and buy this product and, and get a hold of this time-saving device and, and look at this stress reliever and, 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 and you know, buy into this escape from the daily stresses and all this stuff and, and just coming at us hard, aggressively, I would say. And we feel pressure, don't we? We feel under the gun. We, we feel this constant barrage of the world's values and priorities being pushed upon us. And, and the, the reality is, is if we go after that stuff, if we bite on that, we, we'll find that their promises do not, are not fulfilled. If you, if you look over the course of, of, of history, for decades they've been saying, hey, if you, if you just get a few more time-saving devices, if you just do this, your life will be calmer, it'll be better, it'll be more organized. And I'm just saying that, that stuff, it doesn't work, right? We, we use it and we get some more time and then we just fill it with other things. And so if we bite into that, if we chase after that stuff, then it, it just leaves us more, more drained of joy, less peace, not, not more and then, and then it says, you know, drunkenness, which could be, you know, actually, you know, being drunk on alcohol or, or substances, but, but really just this idea of being medicated, just medicating ourselves because we sometimes can't handle all the things and the pressures and the demands and the, and the schedules. And, and, and so we, we try to medicate ourselves or numb that somehow. And then notice this, that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. In other words, when, when it finally hits, it's going to hit hard, isn't it? And, and we're, if we're not careful, we're going to find ourselves ensnared by this. And that's not a place we, we want to be. So today, um, I want to talk about the area of life that perhaps we are most challenged by. I think this is number one. It's why I want to start with it for most people. It's definitely the, the one that I'm the most challenged by. And I have the most, um, just by God's grace and the help of my wife, am I able to kind of keep it in check and, and just... Constantly, though, I got to keep coming back to this, and it's simply this, our time and our schedule. Far and away, that, that is the greatest source of stress in most people's lives. And I found this, this verse in Job 9.25. This is what it says, so true to life for so many of us. It says, my days are swifter than a runner. How many of you feel that way? Like my days, my schedule, my, my events of my days are, are just going faster than I can run. I feel like, Mark, I'm running in all these different directions. I'm, I'm, I'm frantic, I'm breathless, and I, I still can't keep up with all the opportunities and the demands and, the, and the, the, just all the, the commitments that I have to attend to. It says they fly away without a glimpse of joy. That, that's sad is what that is. Our days fly away without a glimpse of joy. You, you know, if we don't guard our heart, if we don't attempt to order our life with God's help in, 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 in the way that God has us to, that's, that's the way, that's the, the story over our life right there. And I can't think of a sadder commentary for a follower of Christ than to be joyless. In fact, let me just get really honest and get really personal and, and practical here for a minute. For some of you, and I don't say this with con condemnation, I, I just, I want to help and I want to, I want to kind of wake you up today, some of us. Some of you don't even have a lot of joy in the midst of this worship service because your mind is so ensnared and, and, and focused on all the things that you have to do. This worship service, to be honest, for some, is because of the pattern of your life, is just one more thing in a very large, stressful to-do list. And I've been there. That's why I can say that with authority. Like, when is this going to be over? Because I've got things to do. This is stressing me out. Right? And we don't want to live that way. That's not the way Christ called us to live. 
here's another thing that we got to overcome. I fear a lot of people, a lot of us perhaps, we make light of stress. We, we kind of, we say it's not that big a deal, right? We, we have stress in our lives and we, we, we don't like it and it, it, it's harming us, we think, but we're not sure how. And it's causing maybe conflict in relationships even, but we're not, we're not sure of the connection there of stress in our relationships. And we know the pace of our life is unsustainable, but we kind of push it off. We say, well, this is how life is today in 2021. This is what everybody's doing. I mean, we just, we got to go if we're going to keep up and, and keep things running. And, and even on top of that, if we're honest, we secretly admire as a whole, as a culture, we secretly admire those who are burning the candle on both ends. Those whose calendars are filled up. Those who are busy. Those who are constantly checking their text messages and trying to multitask with 10 other things and, and, and answering emails and phone calls and their phone's always ringing and they're always going, running and gunning. We tend to admire people like that. By far and away, the most often repeated response I hear, especially at this time of year, when you ask how things are going, people say, busy, you know it. Oh, things are just crazy right now. Maybe someday things will slow down. We hope they will. <laughs> That's a delusion, right? It's not going to change unless we turn to God and, and, and ask him for help in this area of our lives and make some intentional choices. Not too long ago, a study was done by Ohio University. I wanna, what I want to do here is I want to connect. I want to show you how serious this is. And this is connected to other areas of our lives that we may never have even conceived of. But they did a, a study, and this is, I'm, let, let me read a portion of it to you. They say stress has become one of America's leading health concerns. That's astounding. In fact, recent research performed by the American Psychological Association shows that 51% of women, 43% of men in America experience the negative side effects of chronic stress. And that's really what I'm focused on in this message is the, the chronic in this series, the chronic stress. We, there's lots of stress. And actually some stress, by the way, can be good, right? It, it, it can heighten our, our response, it can heighten our adrenaline, it can help us, you know, deal with that difficult, uh, maybe even life-threatening circumstance. So, so st the stress can be a good thing, it can help us um, reach a hard-to-reach goal and achieve good things. But the impact of chronic stress is something we have to be realistic about and honest about. And sometimes the illnesses that come into our lives, the damage into other systems of our bodies, even in our relationships, is directly connected to this living with, persisting in chronic stress. Let me just show you a list really quickly. Did you ever think that your stress was connected to some of these things? Headaches, upset stomach, lack of motivation, change in appetite, difficult sleeping, anger or irritability, chest pain, elevated blood pressure, which we know leads to increased risk of stroke and heart attack, decreased sex drive. Hey, I got some of your attention now, right? Like, oh, oh we, we need to make some changes, man. We got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. Increased risk of developing viral infections. Just this, the impact on your body's immune system as a whole, our excretory system, our digestive system, our, our cardiovascular systems don't function the way they're supposed to when we're living in and exposed to chronic stress without a, a, an intentional remedy. Um, I don't have time to tell you all the details of this, but... Here, here's my first experience with all this. I, I remember about 10 or 12 years ago now, we were serving at another church, and I had this unbelievable pain and just discomfort in my whole chest region, and it was so painful. I, 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 thought, it, I thought I'm having a heart attack. I really did. Something is bad wrong. It's just this aching. I, I can't even describe it to you. In my shoulder, in my neck, in my jaw, just in my all over, just pressure, and I thought something, and I was, we was in the middle of a big event, I couldn't, man, I'm, I'm chugging my Lanta, I'm eating Tums like Skittles, I'm drinking milk, I'm doing anything I can, I'm walking around, I'm breathing, and it's just not, and finally, I, I just kind of press on, but man, I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely concerned, and long story short, I go to the doctor, I get, ch you know, it's serious when a guy goes to the doctor, right, I mean, it's like, I guess genuinely, f I had, I was fearful, like, what is this? And I went to the doctor, and she did her some tests and asked, asked some questions. She said, well, long story short, you are, you're healthy. You're very healthy. Well, what was it? And she said, I, I, I believe that it was a, a, a severe case of acid reflux. And probably you've been having it a long time. 
But it just really, it really got bad. And, and, and she went on to describe some solutions like you need to, um, you know, not eat right before bed. You need to eat earlier and have more time between eating and bed. You need to sleep with your head elevated. I'm in my mid-30s. I'm feeling really old as she's going down this list, right? Like you need to avoid dark liquids, colas, that kind of thing. Okay. And then she said this, how's your stress level? <laughs> I said, I'm a pastor. <laughs> I make that clear, right? I'm a pastor. And, and um, anyway, just it, long, it just led to a, a conversation where just you're going to have to make some changes, right? There's going to have to be some changes in your stress, you know, to deal with the stress in your life, right? You're going to have to approach things differently. And here, here's what I'm trying to say to you. I'm glad that it didn't take something more severe. And now I'm on medication and I'm trying to, and I can, I can tell you though, when I get stressed, when I'm in a high pressure situation, I can feel it. That's one of the, the, the telltale signs in my life. But for some of you, it's, it's more severe than that even. And some of us, we don't even know it's coming. I remember another time we were at a conference as a group of pastors and there was a doctor that came and spoke to us on this very issue. And he was, he was, he was pretty hard on us, but rightfully so. He said, some of you never take a day off and you're proud of it. And it's nonsense. you got to stop. You're not superhuman. You can't go at this forever like that. And, and he told these stories of how he's an emergency room doctor. And he says, he did all these studies, right, and all this experience. And he said, this one artery would clog. And they believe it's linked to high pressure, high stress lifestyles. And, and the, get this, the only symptom, the only symptom that these people had who had this specific artery clogged, forgive me, I can't think of the name of it. But they said the only symptom they ever experienced was death. There wasn't any pain, there wasn't any warning signs or other symptoms, boom, death. That was the first symptom. And he said, this is serious. And he was nailing us pastors right between the eyes because we're, we're one of the, we're, we're among the chief of sinners in this category, right? I'm doing, I'm, by God's grace, I'm doing hard to practice what I preach and what I'm inviting you into today and some of the decisions. But, but it is true, right? For some of you, if you don't change something today, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just being realistic. The, the handwriting is on the wall. And if you don't change something, if you persist, it's not going to end well. Something's going to give. Something's going to break. You know where that phrase, handwriting on the wall, comes from? You, you hear that in the Bible? It's actually uh, from a passage in the Bible. Let me show it to you really quickly. Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. And um, I want to show you this phrase, but I just want to draw out one main principle from this story as well, okay? King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with him. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he, he gave orders. Now, he's going to do something that's going to ultimately be an act of mocking God. And let me just stop and tell you really quickly, God will not be mocked. And so what that means practically for, the, for what we're dealing with today is you, you cannot continue to, to, to live according to the pattern you've been and, and think that you're going to escape the consequences. You, God, God's laws of sowing and reaping will not be undermined. You, God will not be mocked, okay? So he had the gold and the silver goblets brought in that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles and his wives and concubines might drink out of them. And as they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. See, those are all symbols of my own effort, my own accomplishment. I will work as hard as I need to. I'll do as much as I can. I'll earn as much as I can. I'll, I do that for me. That's, that's the, what it symbolizes there. And then suddenly, suddenly it says, and I just want to camp on that word for a minute, again, because I truly believe that some of us listening today, either here or online, if, if you don't get serious and intentional about making some necessary changes in your pace, in your priorities, in your schedule, there's going to come a day where you're going to have a suddenly moment. It's very, very likely. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared. This is really freaky. I, I don't know if this was like the hand floating in the air or it's like the Adams family thing out of a, a box. I, I don't know what this was, but it wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand of the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale. He was so frightened. His legs became weak. His knees began to knock together. Well, you, that's, you know you're scared then. And then notice what the king does. Even though he's filled with fear, even though he's facing a very 
serious thing in his life, what does he do? Does he turn to God? No, he doesn't turn to God and humble himself. He turns to, he calls for a worldly response. He says the king summoned the enchanters, the astrologers, and the diviners, and he said to these quote-unquote wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple. You get a gold chain. You're going to be third in command, all these rewards and blessings. And then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. Well, of course they couldn't. Of course they couldn't. Can I just remind you here this morning, you will never be able to solve spiritual issues with worldly solutions. Never. Amen. You will never be able to. It's like chasing the wind. You can't do it. it you only solve spiritual issues. And I'm, I'm going to suggest to you that in large part, our stress is a spiritual issue. It's a hard issue. It's not the external things. But you're not going to solve that without turning to God. And not only turning to God, but humbling yourself under his lordship and admitting that his lordship has, has command over all your life and, and being a, agreeing with God that his way is the right way. His will and his way are the only way. That's the only answer. It, it, we do this with stress, though. We turn to worldly solutions. It's been suggested that stress triggers inflammation, which is an instigator of heart disease. Now, a lot of experts are kind of still hesitant to say, you know, is, it, is stress directly responsible for the heart attack or whatnot? But this is what they all agree on. They all agree that stress causes some people to act in ways, to start behaving in ways that definitely leads them to increase risk for heart disease. In other words, we, we rely on worldly comforts and worldly answers to try to cope with our stress and our anxiety. Real practical example, when a lot of people get stressed, when some people, I should say, get stressed, what do they turn to? Cookies, pizza, pie, fudge, right? Amen. Should I just open the altars right now? Are we, you want to confess? You want to come and lay that stuff down, right? Um, and, then, and then these these, these high fat, high, you know, unhealthy foods, they lead to, right? They lead to this stuff that causes heart attacks and strokes. Stress can also lead to other heart damaging behaviors such as smoking and alcohol. How many, how many times, and I'm not condemning you if you're a smoker. God, God can, you, you just let God, you know, what does God think about that? I, I, God wants to know you. God wants to have a relationship with you, amen? And if you turn to God, he'll talk to you about that, amen? He'll talk, we're not gonna get legalistic, but he'll talk to you about that. He'll give you the power to overcome it. But, but it leads to those things, your stress, or you turn to these things, right? And it only makes it worse. So King Belshazzar became even more terrified, and his face grew pale, his nobles were baffled. Then there was this inscription, it finally gets deciphered by a guy named Daniel. It, it says, many, many, tekel, parson. And here's what it means. Daniel said, I, I got I, I'll give it to you. And, and, and then it's so cool. Daniel says, you can keep your gifts. I don't want them. You keep all your stuff. I, I'm just going to tell you what it means. Um, me, many, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. And, and by the way, king, it's coming quicker than you think. And then Tekel, um, you have been weighed on scales and found wanting. That's what that means. Not only do you have a limited number of days, but the days you do have left are weighed. They're examined and they're, they're found wanting. Your, 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 your life is out of balance, in other words. There, there's something, and this is true of some of us, there's something missing in your life. And it could be what you need to hear here today. And then Perez, your kingdom is divided and giving to the Medes and Persians. In other words, there's always a high, high price to pay for the way you're ordering your life, for, for this path that you're on, okay? Here's the principle I want to draw, just one. Our days are numbered. Our, our days are numbered. Hebrews 9.27 clearly says it, it is the destiny. Each person is destined to die once and after that to face the judgment. I promise you that's an appointment that we're all going to make. No, no one will be late for it. No one will be exempt from it. That's true of every, me included. You're hearing me, right? This morning you're hearing this? You're all going to die. You're like, well, I'm so glad I came to church this morning. I feel... I just feel so blessed and encouraged, right? I mean, no, I mean, I don't want to be too serious, but, in, in a, I'm, but I'm serious. It, it's a reality for every one of us. Our days are numbered. And it's so important. The reason I'm highlighting this is because if we, if we tend to think that we have a lot of something, an endless supply of something, 
we tend to squander it, don't we? But if we know we have a short supply of something, that something is very limited and it's going to run out, we tend to conserve it, correct? And use it wisely. And, and so we need to think of that, we need to think in terms of this when we think about our, our life here on this earth and make choices accordingly. In fact, doing this simple exercise will really help you, I think. Sometimes you hear people say, well, if it was my last day on earth, what would I do? How about this? Just sit down and get quiet some, some day and say, if I only had 30 days left to live, Hope that's not true of anybody here, but God forbid if you went to the doctor or you found out somehow that you had 30 days left to live. I mean, have you ever sat down and give serious consideration? What would be different? What would, I hope you would change some things. Maybe you would sit down and, and you, would, you would come to the realization, you know, I need to slow down. Maybe I'm not going to work as much overtime. Maybe, maybe I'm going to drastically reduce the amount of TV consumption and social media consumption. That's not, that's not really going to help me in these last 30 days at all. And I'm going to focus more on people around me. Maybe, maybe you would say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to be in worship every, every opportunity, every Sunday I'm going to be in worship this last month of my life because that's what's going to help me know him better. Maybe you'd say, I'm going to give, I'm going to give generously to the kingdom of God because I can't take it with me. Uh, maybe I'm going to call some loved ones up and some friends and I, 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 there's been some tension and some distance between us and I'm going to figure that out and I'm going to do what I can, play my part to make it right. We're going to get this settled because I don't want to go into eternity with that between us. And You might choose to alter some things like that. But guess what? The Bible says to us all very clearly, your life is but a mist. If I had a spray bottle up here, just I could spray it and just you could watch that mist fall. That's, your life is like that. In another passage in Psalm 39, it says our lives are no more than a hand width Measured by a hand width. They're no more than a breath. You go out on a cold morning and breathe. And that little puff of breath that you can see, that's, that's the imagery of our lives. And, and so our days are numbered. And maybe you don't have 30 days left to live. Maybe less. I don't know. Maybe a whole lot more. Maybe decades and decades. But, but shouldn't we begin to make changes as if our days are numbered? Because, because they are. And we need to remember that the misuse of our time the misordering of our life will always cost us something. It did Belshazzar, it'll cost us relationships, health, peace of mind, joy. Just, listen, just the ability to, to have some margin in my life so I can have some time to tune into the still small voice of God and actually hear what the creator of the universe would want to say to me. You, can you believe that? That God Almighty would actually want to talk into your life. And direct you personally. But, but if I'm stressed out, if I'm running all over, I can't hear him and much less respond to that. And, and maybe there's more, of a few, more than a few of you here today who, you know, you say, okay, I'm, I, I get what you're saying, Pastor Mark. I, I, I know I need to make some changes. And I know I can't keep blaming it on external stuff. I, I know it's in here. It's something I've got to decide. Some priorities in my life. So what do I do about this? Well, that's what I want to close the rest of this, the, the message time out with. And let me offer you a thought as we get into some real practical help here. Maybe you've never thought of it in terms like this before, but obviously you've chosen to make this a priority. You've come to, to worship. You've gathered with God's people. You've made, made this day, uh, uh, made this first part of the week a priority in seeking God. I'm so glad you did. It's the best decision you can make of your week. But it's interesting how the Bible talks about this day. It refers to it as a Sabbath day or a day of rest. But, but this is actually how it refers to it, the Lord's day. The Lord's day. And so I just want to offer you this thought. You're, you've done a portion of it already. You made the effort to get up, to set aside this time, to get in the presence of God, to hear the word, to worship, all of this stuff. But what, what about this? Let me ask you this question. What if we had an entire day every week dedicated to the Lord? What if we said one day a week is going to be the Lord's day? It's going to be the Lord's day. It's going to be a day for him and, and for, for me to get with him. And you say, well, what, what does that mean exactly? I'm not saying you need to be in a setting like this all day long on Sunday, okay? You know, hearing a message and, and worshiping. And Can I just be honest? I'm the pastor and I wouldn't want to be here all day. All right, y'all, this is great. I love this. I look forward to this. I can't wait to be with you, but that's not necessarily what we need. 
But we, we, we need to do what refreshes and refills us. So maybe, maybe, maybe your day of the Lord would look like this. Maybe after this time, because this is important to put this first. But maybe part of the day would be looking like this. Maybe you would actually sit down to the table and have a great meal with your family. Maybe some close friends that you invited over. Maybe you'd invite someone who doesn't have any family in the area. And you'd invite them over to sit at your table. What, what if you actually laid down and rested for a couple hours this afternoon? And took a nap. Amen? You feel the joy rising in your heart right now, right? Just like, man, that is. What if, what, if, what if this? What if you took the hand of someone you loved or you called a friend up and you said, hey, let's go for a walk. Or let's go for a drive. Or let's just sit together. Let's just talk. We, we haven't, we've been going so hard, so fast. Let's just sit and talk. For some of you, after you picked your loved one up off the floor, because they passed out in, in amazement, you, you just pick them right back up and you just do that, right? You can go for a walk. Maybe for some of you, it looked like... Um, Getting together with your small group. Maybe playing a game with your family or with friends or whatever it may be. What, what, if, what if you didn't just give God an hour and a half or so once a week and then went right back to the rat race as soon as you got back in the car. But what if there was an actual day of the Lord to refresh you and refill you and, and for you to reconnect with him in intentional, practical ways. What if sometime every Sunday you just took 30 minutes. In that whole day you took 30 minutes and you set that aside just to get alone and quiet with God. And just to examine your life and actually ask God to, re to examine your heart. And say, God, is there anything you want to reveal to me? Is there and just get still for maybe, maybe even 20 or 30 minutes would be amazing, right? Is this striking a chord with anybody? Would anybody say, I, I could use that. that? I think that's the issue, right? So let me talk to you about my day of rest real quick, just real briefly. It's not, not on Sunday. Because as a pastor, in my calling, in my role here, um, Sundays are actually very, very full for me. I'm not saying that. I'm, I don't despise that. That's my calling. It's what I've chosen to do for the, serve the Lord. But, but Sundays are, there's no way. There's just no way on a Sunday I, I can have a day of rest. Um, so my day, my day of the Lord is Friday. You say, what do you do on Friday for your day of the Lord? I do what refreshes and refills me. That's what I do. And it varies from week to week, depending on the schedule, time spent with family, um, you know, spending time with the Lord, obviously, listening to messages from pastor friends of mine so I can get fed and I can get, you know, just new insights and thoughts and, and, and hunting and fishing and all that stuff and uh, decompressing. And that's what refreshes and refills me. But, but I, I want to, I, I just, I'm committed to that. Now, if there's a death, if there's a funeral, if there's a Christ, obviously that takes priority and, and God will help me there. But... But as a pattern, Fridays are my day of rest. I don't answer phone calls. I don't answer emails. I don't answer texts. I try to, I try to get away from my phone. I, I don't, I, I'm not perfect at it. Amy helps me. She's awesome. And, and, and so I try to do that. I, I, I just, I, I, I've made a commitment to not be gone any more than three nights out of the week. I try to build that into my schedule. So events and meetings and, and services and and. Just try to be able to be attentive and refreshed and refilled. Because again, I, I don't just want to tell you what to do. I want to I lead by example, amen? And if I'm not doing this, I mean, doing this has greatly helped me not to be counted in the statistics, the casualties of pastors among the 1,500 pastors who leave the ministry every single month in this country. To be counted among the 50% of pastors whose marriages blow up and end in divorce. I've just decided I, after 20 years of doing this, I'm, I'm going to be serious about doing what I need to do, what God calls me to do really. All right? And I want you to do the same. So here's, here's some practical things. Ready? I'm going to give you three things. Under this first one, there's three little sub points, and then I'll give you two others, okay? And then we're going to have an illustration, pray, and we'll be gone. But here's the first one. Refocus on what really matters that's the first thing you need to do. If you want to uh, get victory over the stress in your schedule and your life and find yourself at peace and rest and joyful, you need to refocus on what really matters. You know, sometimes, again, it would help just to carve out some time to be intentional about this and reevaluate and say, you know, I don't have to do every activity that I could do. I don't have to do everything that others want me to do. And I'm talking about consistently taking inventory of your life. And our culture is so crazy. This isn't a once a month thing or a once a year thing for sure. This is a once a week thing. Because it's amazing how fast this can get out of whack, right? And all of a sudden you're laying there in bed going, how did it get like this? We, 
I didn't even talk to my kid. I haven't talked to my family. I, mean, I don't even know what's going on. I'm just overwhelmed. I'm, you need to take inventory of your life. Focus on what really matters. And, and lo, let me give you those three subpoints now. Here's three thoughts on what really matters. Number one, relationships matter. Relationships matter. I promise you, people on their deathbed do not wish they had spent one more hour in the office. They're not thinking about all the emails that are unread and, 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 and the text and the, and the meetings and the promotion and the extra income. And they're not thinking about that. They're, they're, they're wanting their loved ones near them. They want to be surrounded by those that they know and love. And, and, and for some of you, the best thing you could do today, this is as practical as I can get, the best thing you can do today is shove some of the stuff off your already overcrowded plate and again, take the hand of someone you love and say, let's just, let's go for a walk. A beautiful day, by the way. Let's sit, let's talk, let's, 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 let's talk about our life, let's talk about the direction we're headed, what, whatever it may be. And for others of you, if you're not already connected, you need to get connected to a small group because that is hands down the best way that relationships get built here. You know, some people, it may, they may think, man, this church is too big for me. I, I, don't, I can't be a part of this. It, this. If you'll give it a chance, this church is smaller than you think it is. But you need to get involved in a small group. Get in a small group. Get in a small group. I can't say it enough. <laughs> we're we're going to keep preaching that message, right? Because I, here's why. Here's why. It's not just a program. When the storms of life win, the storms of life hit your life. When the wrecking ball comes sweeping, and it will, it's going to look different for you than me, but it will happen to all of us. We live in a fallen world. It'll happen. When that happens, you do not want to be standing alone because you've been so out of balance and running so hard and so fast in so many directions that you didn't take time to build relationships. You don't want to be alone when that time comes. That's an awful place to be. Instead, when that storm of life blows through your life and your family, you want to be standing in the middle of a small group, amen? Surrounded by people who will lay their hands on you, surround you, hug you, pull you in close, say, you're not going to walk through this alone. We're going to help you. We're here for you all the way through, amen? And, and, and who you can turn to and say, man, can you watch my kids today? Because I, I got to travel here and I got to deal with this. Can you take my kids? Can you feed them? Can you clean my house? Can you watch my, whatever it may be. Can you give me some counsel and navigate this? Because this is crazy. We've never been this way before. And I just give you one practical, powerful story on this. Man, Wednesday night, I'm not going to mention any names, but Wednesday night, I've had the privilege, my wife and I have had the privilege of leading a small group this last, oh, by the way, let me say this. This current session, this current semester of small groups is coming to an end next Wednesday. But we're starting a brand new, with new opportunities for small groups, December 8th. You'll hear a lot more about that. Pastor Linda, she's already got it planned out. But December 8th, if you want to start a small group, um, talk to Pastor Linda as well. But we're in a small group called Alt Art of Parenting. And it's been great the whole way through, all 10 weeks. But man, this last session, uh, it was like a worship service, folks. We had food and fellowship, and we talked, and we recapped the, the series, and then we got in a circle, and we prayed. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit came around us. If you were in that group, do you, am I lying? If you were in that group, you know what I'm talking about? Absolutely. And man, just people began to share their heart, and people were, were weeping, and they were getting honest, and I was like, this is it, man. I just thought, this is it. This is it's a picture of what it's all, this, this is what God wants for us all. And, and some begin to express a really serious need, and, and, and we begin to throw out resources and rally around them, and, and they'd never shared that before. But in that small group, they knew they could trust. And then another single mom, man, I'm just, I feel like I'm drowning here, and I, my kids and my husband's deployed, and man, people, man, mamas begin to rally around her and bring her in, and we'll, hey, we'll watch your kids, and we'll, we got this group, and, and we'll bring you a meal, and, and it was the most powerful thing, I'm telling you. That's what God wants every one of you to experience, amen? You say, well, my, my experience in small groups has not been like that. Well, keep trying. Don't give up, okay? Keep trying and, and keep reaching out. Relationships matter. And then God's purposes matter. For many people, this is the missing ingredient in their life. But I would suggest to you the only way that the abundant life that Jesus talks about and offers to us is going to be experienced is only by you doing the thing that God has called you to do. The Apostle Paul says it like this, my life is worth nothing, nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work, get this, assigned to me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news of God's wonderful grace. Let me just challenge you with this, whether you realize it or not, 
you have a work to do assigned to you by God. You were specifically, uniquely created for it. So my challenge to you is find out what it is and do it. Find it and do his work in his way. And no matter what you walk through, no matter what you're experiencing, no matter the stress and the pressure, you're going to have his joy flowing in you like a spring. Okay, it's so important. If you don't know what that is, need some help, we'll help you. You've, you've heard in the education realm of IEPs, right? I, individual educational plan, is that what it is? Well, how about an IDP? I thought of this. We, we talk about this sometimes. It's not official. We don't have a program for it. But we've, helped, we've done this with people. IDP, an individual discipleship program. And you meet with Pastor Linda or me or Pastor Eli or Sarah or whoever, so a leader of our small groups, and meet with them and say, man, I want, I want to discover my purpose. And they can begin to give, give you some things to think about and guide you. Um, finally, eternity matters. Eternity matters. I've heard it said like this, if you could gather up all the sand on all the beaches all over the world and pile it up in one big pile and reach into that pile and grab one nearly invisible grain of sand, that one grain of sand would be your life and my life here on this earth. And all the sand piled up would be all time for all eternity. E eternity matters. And so since that is true, it just makes sense, right, to be living life in light of eternity with an eternal perspective Right here, right now. So I want to challenge you, because eternity is coming faster than we all think it is, I want you to work towards it and give towards it and live towards it and prepare for it, okay? Because Jesus said in Matthew 13, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. And when a guy found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all that he had, all that he had. And he bought that field. You say, Pastor Mark, what's the field? The field represents eternity. And if you and I really understood how much eternity matters, I'm telling you, we would, it would drastically alter our lives. We would aim everything and invest every part of our life into it. Because I'm telling you, 100 years from now, that's the only thing that's going to matter. So... Focus on what matters most, those three things. Number two, reduce the non-essentials very quickly. You won't be able to reduce probably all the non-essentials. But if you get serious about this today, put this into action, you can drastically reduce some of the non-essential things. Just again, it's a matter of simply stopping and reflecting and evaluating and, and, and just being honest, right? And just saying, you know what? I probably don't need to watch eight hours of Netflix today. I probably can just... Cross that off the list, right? And, and it's, it's, it's not helping me, right? In the things that matter most. It's draining me, actually. It's stealing my joy. King Solomon said it like this. He had some great advice. He actually said it's better for you to do less than more. Ecclesiastes 4, 6. Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. You might say, well, Pastor Mark, I've got two hands. I can do it. Listen, but when your two hands are full of all the grasping and the growth, and you're, you're full, you can't do anything else, can you? Better to have one handful of living and have the other hand free to be used for God and what God wants to put in there. That, that's called margin. That's a great way to live. Just to one handful of living is enough. I heard this shocking statistic. The average American, Ameri about half of Americans actually, are living, get this, living on 117% of their income. That's, I'm not a smart man, but that's more. That's more than we, right? That's, that's too much. It's, it's not working. It's unsustainable. We're, in, in our culture, you know what? A lot of us, we're not living with just two handfuls. We're trying to get a toehold in there, right? We're tucking it under our neck and under our arm, and we're trying to go through life and, and just, and we're burned out. We're stressed out. We're, we're to the max. And so a helpful exercise. How many of you like to-do list? You like to-do list? I'm not, I'm not a big list person. It gets me in trouble. But, but if you have a to-do list, how about how, whether you do or don't on that, do this. Have a, create a not-to-do list. Wouldn't that be great? Before you commit, before you say yes, before you schedule it, create your list of opportunities. Create a not-to-do list alongside your to-do list. Again, when we moved here four years ago, I, I, I really tried to make a commitment that I wasn't going to be home I mean, I wasn't going to be gone from home and from my family more than three nights a week, right? With meetings, with events, with everything. I mean, I, I could be gone. I could be gone seven nights a week if I wanted to. 
There's that much opportunity. I would love to be in all your small groups. I'd love to be in all your meetings. I'd love to be in all your homes. I'd love to do all that. I really genuinely would, but I cannot. I cannot, so I just, I'm not going to, uh, and, and, and God has revealed to me over the years the arrogance and the foolishness of my ways as a younger pastor, thinking I could do it all. Thinking I, I could be everything that I need, and, and God has just revealed that to me, and so, again, I'm trying to, I, I know this, I'll be a much better husband, I'll be a much better father, I'll be a much better pastor to you all if I actually live out what I'm asking you to do, Right? So I'm, I'm trying to model that to you. So focus on what really matters. Reduce the non-essentials. Here's the last one. Re reprioritize your life. I'm going to end with this illustration here. Before I pull the illustration out, let me just tell you, it's not just important what you do. That's what we tend to focus on. Well, if I just do the right things, no, that's not the issue. That's, that's important, but it's not the most important thing. It's not just a matter of what you do. It's a matter of the order in which you do it. The order in which you do the things in your life, the things that God wants you to do, matter greatly. Let me show this to you. Many of you have seen this illustration many, many times. It, it's, it's been around a lot. You've, if you've been to any kind of business leadership thing, you've seen this. Teachers' trainings have seen this, I'm sure. But I tried to think of a fresh new example to, to illustrate and highlight this, but I could not, okay? I just couldn't think of anything better. So if you've seen it, it's a good reminder. But here's, what, here's, here's the reality. This represents all the activity in our life, our schedules, all our time, dropping off the kids at school, all the duties at home, um, just appointments, text messages, emails, everything. And let's be honest, most of it, most of it is Facebook, right? That social media, Snapchat, whatever. So, so we got all this in there. And then we say, you know what? I... I know, that, I know that relationships are important, and, and pastor wants us to be in a small group, and so, okay, we're going we're gonna to sign up December 8th for a small group and get that in there. And then I know my purpose in God is important, and I, I want to live that out. I want to do the work assigned to me by, by God, and so I, I put that in there, and I'm already stressing out. And then, and then God comes, I know God's important, and worship, and, and giving, and serving, and all that, but then I, oh, but I, can't, I can't make it fit, Right? And then sadly, here's what happens. Because we, we know we, we're maxed out, we're overloaded, this is the first thing to go for most of us. That's why the average stat, <laughs> the average statistic is that people in America only worship about one time a month in a setting like this. Twelve times a year. And we wonder what's wrong, right? Because we've taken out the most important thing so we can make this work. We can make life work. It's not working. So what if we did it in a different order? What if you put first things first? Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God, right? Everything else will be added to you. So what if we said, God's, God's first. God's first. I'm going to make my relationship with him top priority, pleasing him above pleasing other people. I know my purpose in Christ matters, and so I'm going to find out what that is, and I'm going to give myself to it because I know the difference I make on other people's lives here and around the world, even if I never see it, is what truly matters. And then, and then I'm going to make relationships important. I'm going to I'm going to make some changes at home and in my marriage. And I'm going to get into small group because that, that's really what's going to sustain me. And then, and then I got all this. And it, it, even though it's wise to take some of this out and drastically reduce, even if I don't reduce anything, guess what? Same amount of stuff. But now because of the order, guess what? It all fits, right? Amen. It, it all fits. It all works. That's what we're challenging you to do. That's what we want you to do. That's what we want you to go ahead and make some practical, practical decisions, okay? I want, that's why we want to encourage you to put God first. Put God first in your worship, in your weekly schedule. Before you schedule anything else, you say, my t worship with God. That's how that comes first. For, that's why we challenge you to put God first in your giving. The first 10% before everybody else gets their cut and gets their grubby hands on it. You say, God, I, I owe you everything. And I'm going to give back a 10% of, of uh, it's a tithe. It's an act of worship, an offering. You, by the way, this is so cool to me. Did you know we had, we had 10 people? We, we gave that tithing challenge. We had 10 people say, you know what? I'm going I'm, I'm to become a, I'm going to become a, I'm going to put God first in my finances. Amen. We had 10 families, 10 people in our church do that. I can't, I can't wait to hear the stories from that. It's going to be amazing. First in everything, in fact, we're so convinced of this, we felt like God was speaking to us that in January of 2022, we're going to kick off the whole year with that theme. I felt God pressing that theme on my heart. God first. We're going to start a sermon series with that. We're going to have a time of prayer and fasting. We're going to kick off this year right, amen? As, as individuals and as a whole, putting God first. So I want to pray for us, okay?
If you're able to stand, would you stand to your feet? And if you're online, don't tune off yet. Don't, don't go anywhere. I want to include you in this as well. I, I've been praying for our, our, our gathering. I've been praying for all of us, but I, I've been praying especially for some of you that your hearts are weighed down. For some of you, it's, it's, the pace is frantic. Again, maybe there's not even a lot of joy being in this setting here today because you're just so overwhelmed with everything else. And I've, I've just been praying that for some of you that this is a crisis moment now. And you're feeling the impact of this in other areas. Your health, perhaps. Maybe your marriage, at home, your finances. The handwriting's on the wall for some of you. And I, I just want to pray for you specifically that you'll have the courage and the Wisdom from God to make necessary changes. But here's my hope and my confidence here today. Okay, you ready for some good news? We serve a God who is present with us today. We serve a God who is so incredible and loves you so much. He wants to guide you. He wants to direct your day-to-day -day life. He wants to give you his wisdom so you can align your life with his values and principles. And here's the most amazing things. You ready for this? You didn't just come this morning to, to get a neat little illustration or to get some practical principles, time-saving devices, right? In your schedule. That's not why you came. We're, we're in the presence of a God who cannot just help you change those things. He can change your heart. Amen? He can, ch listen, I'm telling you, he can change your heart. How many of you believe that? And what you need, it, that's what we need. Because at the root, at the heart of it, this is, not just a, this is not just rearranging the external things on the calendar. I need a change of heart. And only God can change your heart. And so let's look to him. Let's, let's pray this morning. Father God, thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you for the power of your word, certainly. But thank you for the practicality of your word, God. And I just pray for the courage and the wisdom that can only come from you to help us make some of the changes that we know we need to make, some conversations that we need to have, some examination of our lives. Help us to be honest about that. And God, help us so desire you, God. Help us to be so captivated by you that we hunger and we thirst for you. We, we run after you, God, not chasing after all these things in our world. And I pray, God, that the Lord's day, the Lord's day would be the most powerful day of our week. And that you'll use even this time and the other moments we spend with you throughout the week to change us from within. If you look up here for just a second, I want to give you the one last verse. Matthew 11. Matthew 11, verse 28, is an invitation from the Lord himself, Jesus, to say, come to me, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. Some of you are like, man, that, that was written about me. Come to me and I will give you rest. Honestly, if you were to say, Pastor Mark, can you, can you sum up the entire Christian life in one word? I, I think I might use that word right there. Rest. Rest. True rest. And he goes on in the next part of the verse to say, rest for your souls. Not just this external physical rest, but that's important. But rest inside for your soul. You know, followers of Christ, we're not exempt from the challenges and the sufferings and the trials and the hardships of life. We're not exempt from that. We, we too get weary. We, uh, how many of you say, as a Christ follower, I, I'm heavily burdened sometimes. We, we are. We, we get like that. But here's the difference. In Jesus, we have a refuge. In Jesus, we find peace. Peace that surpasses all description, all circumstances. And, and as we turn to Jesus, as we put him first, as we stay, stay connected to him, I'm telling you, he can do something supernatural in your life. He can change your heart, give you a new perspective. He, he can fill you in, right in the middle of all the craziness that you may be going through right now. He says, I will give you rest. Jesus says, I will give you rest. Some of you need it. Some of you need it this morning. And it's yours to experience by just trusting him and saying, God, you're Lord of my life. I'm going to follow you. I want to pray one more prayer for one more minute, okay? And this is simply to say, for those of the rest of you, if you've never come into a relationship with Jesus, today could be your day. Maybe you've 
committed to Christ. Once upon a time, you've been following him, but you drifted away. You wandered away somehow, somewhere. You, you got off track, and you're, you're far away from him today, and you've been gone too long. I just want to tell you, it's time to come home. It's time to turn back to him, and what you'll find is, is the Father God waiting for you with arms wide open, waiting to receive you. For others of you, you've never there's never been a time in your life where you've turned to Jesus and put your faith in him. If you're honest, you'd say, I do not have a relationship with God. I mean, I'm just saying I don't, but I need him. I need him so much. What, what do I need to do? Here's what I would tell you to do this morning. Surrender full control of your life to God today before you leave. Just surrender full control of your life. Just say, God, I need you. I can't. I've been running too hard without you. I've been, I've been trying to do it on myself, and I can't do it, and I need you. And I open my heart to you today. I confess my sins. I ask you to forgive me, cleanse me, and make me your very own. I want to follow you. That's what you do. Your life will change. God will begin to work in you in ways that you can't even begin to imagine. Here's what I want to know today. I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. I'm not going to ask you to speak. We're not going to ask you to come front or highlight you in any way. But I think a boldness of response is necessary. A physical response saying, God, here I am. I've heard you. I'm responding to you. And if you want that, if you want me to pray for you and lead you in this prayer, I'm going to ask you right now to slip up your hand right now. Anywhere across this sanctuary. There's one right there. Just keep it up. We're going to, someone, a friend with a blue bag is going to find you. We're just going to stand with you because there's some helpful things in that bag I'll talk about later. But right now, just responding to whatever God has for you. Anybody else, you've been so bold. So courageous to say, here I am, God, I need you. Anybody else? Take two more seconds. All right, I want to pray. I want to pray for these that raise their hands. And we're all going to pray, okay? Because we don't put our friends on the spot, make them pray by themselves. Let's all pray. Whether you've prayed this 100 times or one, let's all pray together. Ready? If you want to turn to God, forgiveness of sins, coming back to God, whatever the need is for you, pray something like this to him right now. Father God. I need you. I admit that I've sinned. And my sins separate me from you. But Father, today I ask that you would forgive me of all my sins. And you would cleanse me. And you would be my Lord and my Savior. I thank you for what you've done for me. You gave your life for me. You died on the cross, and I believe you rose from the dead, and I believe in you. I put my faith in you today. Lead me. Guide me. Help me to follow you, and help me to serve you and put you first all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey. That's the best decision any person could ever make in this life. And if you made that, that prayer of faith, God heard that, and he's responded. He, he's going to begin to work in you as you follow him. In that bag is a connect card. Make sure you fill that out, please. We're not trying to get personal information of you, but we want to follow up with you. We want to encourage you because this is a journey. It's not a one-time decision. There's some helpful things in there. There's a CD in there. There's a, there's a link to something about 13 minutes long. You need to listen to that as soon as you possibly can, okay? And you're going to continue to grow in Christ. It's going to be amazing what he's going to do in and through you. Amen? All right. Hey, let's celebrate the Lord.